Hi, I'm Bob Gimlin. This video contains four cryptid encounters that I've received over the years. First, the Sprinting Coffer. Bob, I own land in North Carolina, out west, by the roots of the mountains. It's a lot of land that I use to trap and hunt. Mink, beavers, coyotes, foxes, bobcats, you name it, I have it. I've had good luck with bobcats. I just got off my four-wheeler to check a line when I heard this retching, like a big man vomiting, like after you've been drinking all weekend but hadn't eaten anything. It was so close and so clear that I was surprised I didn't hear vomit hitting the earth. The brush on either side of my trail was thick, so I couldn't see much. It was only about 6 p.m., but I was in the shadow of a ridge, and it was November, so it was already dark under the trees. It was about 50 degrees. I thought the retching I heard must have come from a person, because I'd never heard anything like that from an animal before. It really did sound like a heavy man throwing up, mixed with a deep cough. Now this really wet my hen. I had spent so much time marking off my land with signs, and I roped and fenced off much of it. Trust me, it is impossible to stumble onto my land. A person has to go right past no trespassing private property signs every step of the way. So I grabbed my 30-30 Marlin off the four-wheeler and went after this guy. My heart was pounding, and I was ready to put the fear of God into a person. It took off as soon as I went after it. You have to trust me on this. I'm fast. I'd put myself up against just about anyone moving through those hollers. And this guy was quick. I was right behind him for three or four minutes. But I gave up, because I started to panic a little. And that's when mistakes happen. I was so close the whole time, but never saw him. I never gained or lost a foot. I'd say it was thirty feet ahead of me. No more, no less. The whole time. This is how close. The brush was still moving by the time I got to where it had passed. Like I said, I gave up and set my back against a tree to get some air. It kept going, and it was gone. It sounded like a person. The footfalls never overlapped like any four-legged animal should. Step, 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 step. Never overlapping, one after the other. Just like a person running. That's another reason I thought it was a person at first, but I couldn't catch up with it. If it was a person, I would have caught him. Whatever it was was on two legs, and I couldn't catch it. It was right about that time that it gets too dark to see under the canopy. It must have had better eyes than me. I would have caught him if it was a him. No question. Especially the way he was carrying on right after hacking its lungs and guts out. But see, if it was just a deer or bear, it would have outpaced me in a heartbeat. I use my GPS regularly, and it tracks my speed. So I have a pretty good sense of that. I'm sure I was hitting dirt at at least eight or nine miles per hour. And this thing kept pace perfectly. It never went faster than me, and it never went slower than me. A bear is going to be going at least 25 miles an hour, running away from you. A hog even faster, and a deer faster still. What I mean to say is, four minutes is a long time to chase something so evenly. The only animals big enough to make those noises should have outpaced me in a matter of seconds. Whatever it was, it sounded big. Which leads me to believe it was toying with me. When I sat against that tree to catch my breath, I waited a long time. Maybe fifteen minutes. I was sweating, so I was getting cold. All was quiet. It was unnaturally still. I started to shiver, and I told myself it was just from the chill. I had never been more scared in the woods. As a matter of fact, I hadn't ever really been scared in the woods before at all. Back when I was maybe twenty-five, I got lost in the woods. I wasn't really lost. I just wasn't certain on how to get back, and I needed more time than there was daylight left. So I made a fire and a shelter, and walked out just fine in the morning. That didn't spook me a bit. But on that November night, I can't even tell you if my heart or mind was racing faster. I walked back the way I came to the four-wheeler. I checked my snare, and there was nothing. Usually I would have fiddled with it and reset it somewhere else but I just took it with me. I didn't go back there for about a month. Hindsight is always twenty twenty. 
I think this thing made that noise to get my attention. I think it ran just slow enough for me to keep on chasing it, but just fast enough so that I wouldn't catch it. I'm sure it was distracting me, diverting my attention, leading me on a wild goose chase. So the question to me is, what would I have encountered if I ignored the coughing and carried on to my trap? I can't really tell you why I didn't scope out the trail in the morning. Like I said, I didn't go back there for some time. It didn't want me to see it, so maybe it's best I don't. Like if a bear is running away from me, I'd just as soon let it. No need to provoke or antagonize something, especially something I don't understand. Whatever it is, it leaves my traps alone, which seems decent of it. I'd be able to see prints if it messed with the traps. After that, I put a dozen game cameras out there. Never spotted anything unusual. Your video about game cameras explained that to me. This experience really got me thinking about all the weird things that have happened in the past 45 years here. I heard this thing clearly. I heard it coughing, and I heard it running. And it stayed close to me. I'm familiar with all the usual suspects. And those it was not. Whenever I hear someone say, nothing can be hiding out there, I just laugh. Some people don't have a clue. The Tree Hugger Bob, 20 years ago when I was a kid, I would walk on my neighbor's property almost every day after school. They had hundreds of acres of land on the Rocky River in North Carolina, and they let me use it. It had plenty of good trails, all wooded. One day, I had crossed the street and gone into the neighbor's woods. I had only been out there for five minutes or so, and had only walked about a quarter of a mile. When I saw this thing, it was only about fifteen feet away when I noticed it. To my left was a small creature hanging onto the side of a tree, just a couple of feet from the trail. It was about eight feet off the ground, and it was hugging the tree trunk exactly the way a koala bear does. But its arms were too long and body too slim. It probably weighed thirty-five or forty pounds, and its body was some three feet in length. Its arms, by proportion, seemed long and spindly. I definitely got the impression that it was a baby of whatever it was. I think it was frozen in fear, as its head was buried in its chest. It was hiding its face. I have no idea what it was. To this day, I have no idea what it was. My first thought was that it was a baby bear, and that I needed to carefully back away. But at the same time, I could clearly see it wasn't a bear. The proportion was all wrong. It wasn't a raccoon, it was way too big to be a raccoon. It wasn't any animal I've ever seen, in person, on TV, or in books. If it had been a bear, I would have slowly backed away because it was small enough to have had a mother nearby. But I didn't. I stood in the same spot and stared at the creature for probably over five minutes. Finally, my nerves got the best of me, and I went home. I drew a picture of it, but I'm not very good at drawing. At the time, I tried to convince myself it was a baby bear, but I swear it wasn't. Its fur was grayish-black, but my memory may have distorted it to seem gray because I browsed so many photos of sloths and koala bears since the sighting. It was primarily black, I'd say. Honestly, the closest thing I could come to was a sloth, because of the long arms and round, earless head. I remember the part of the head I could see seemed featureless. Its hair was shaggy like a sloth, and it had very long arms and legs like a sloth. Its hands and feet were on the other side of the tree, so I couldn't see them, and its head was hidden. I know that doesn't sound very Bigfoot-like. It's just a very strange memory. I froze when I saw it, but I don't even know if I froze because I saw the animal, or if I froze before I saw the animal. I know that sounds weird, but I remember freezing before actually seeing it. I remember my stomach plunging when I saw it. The way you're always shocked when you see something close that you weren't expecting. I can tell you, there have been dozens if not hundreds of times that I've had strange feelings in the woods, but never saw anything. But it makes me wonder if maybe something is sometimes close. 
Many times as a kid and as an adult, I've heard strange noises in the woods. Knocks, whistles, and hoots, but nothing that couldn't have been something known. Perhaps the strangest part of all of this is how at the time I felt like I was in trouble, as if I had done something wrong and I needed to conceal this experience at all costs. Like I shouldn't even have been there in the first place, though I had permission from the owners. Like if my mom had asked how my day was, I would have said, Fine, normal, I definitely didn't see a cryptid eight feet up a tree. How was your day? I was just inexplicably paranoid about it, I guess. Like if someone found out about what I had witnessed, I would have been in big trouble. Which is ridiculous. None of the adult figures in my life were like that. You can absolutely tell my story. I've never been afraid to tell it. It's just not very interesting. Most of the time it just gets a, huh, and a change of subject. It's hard to explain something that you honestly have no idea about. The Orb Bob My first and only paranormal experience happened while I was at work in my office. I was just working on the schedule, so it was nothing crazy or exhausting enough to trick my eyes. I had been working for maybe an hour when I noticed this light. It was stationary, and somewhere between the size of a baseball and the size of a softball. It was beside this tapestry that I had hung to soften the corner of the room. I put my glasses on to get a better look. My first thought was, I didn't put a light there. Who put a light there? Then I realized the light wasn't connected to anything. My office was brightly lit, so it didn't seem all that bright. It looked just like a cheap light bulb in a bright room. It glowed a solid tan yellow color. Then it darted behind my monitor, and it looped around to go straight in between my back and the chair, and I didn't see it on the other side of me. But I could feel where it hit me, right between my shoulder blades. It felt weird all day, but I know that happens sometimes if you focus on any sensation for too long. It felt just like being grazed by a softball. And I've played a lot of softball. In fact, I'd say the orb zigged and zagged at about 40 miles per hour. This is my only paranormal experience to date, other than binge-watching a series called A Haunting the Summer I Caught Mono. I had no interest or information on the subject. For some reason, I've wondered if the tapestry had anything to do with it. A bit of sleuthing revealed that the wall-hanging tapestry was made in India sometime between 1995 and 2001, so it isn't exactly an object of mystery. The other thing I wonder and I suppose this is what I found the most alarming. Why didn't I see it after it touched my back? Did it go inside me? I guess I'm just wondering if you've ever heard tell of any similar occurrences, or have any opinion whatsoever on what it could mean. The office park is kind of old, and a lot of my co-workers have claims of paranormal encounters. Children laughing, footsteps running down the hall, things being moved. I'm skeptical of these claims, which I'm sure sounds weird considering what I've just told you. The Face Hey Bob, I had an experience with something about ten years ago. I remember it like it was yesterday. This took place at about 1 a.m. I was making my way out of Oklahoma through Dewey County on Highway 60 at the curve heading out of town. Once I was in the middle of the curve of the highway, where it turns into 34, something appeared next to my truck, running beside me. This is a box truck, and it's about 10 feet or more from the ground at the top of the cab, and this face was eye level with me. It was keeping pace, and I was accelerating to 70 miles per hour. I still don't know what to make of it. Still to this day, I have dreams about it, and I'm not sure what it was. It looked at me like it was amused, and challenging me. Then all of a sudden it leapt into the trees. It was just this huge, man-like thing running next to my vehicle. You wouldn't mistake it for a bird. Trust me, it still doesn't make sense. To this day, I can't wrap my head around it. I feel like I'm a freak or crazy when I tell people about it. I've only told a few people, and I got the same answer. 
you're nuts, or shut up. I wasn't seeing things, and I don't do drugs. I honestly have no idea if it was a cryptid or paranormal entity, but I've decided that I'm okay with either, but not both. Anyway, was a strange experience. The Monkey at the Spring Bob, my grandmother told me a story that happened to her in the 1950s. She told it to me after she saw the wallpaper on my computer, which was the alleged Bigfoot that Patterson filmed. One day while she was keeping busy, she noticed my monitor. She looked at it, blinked a few times, and said that she and her friend saw one of those ones. They lived in southern Missouri. She and a girlfriend were 16 years old. It was July, and they were swimming in a spring. They called it a swimming pool. She said the water was clean, cool, and clear, and that the mud was good for their skin. They were there for about half an hour, when they heard what they thought sounded like a branch falling from a tree. They didn't think much of it, when her friend pointed and said, Look, look. In a tree, almost over the water, they said they saw what she described as a big monkey. When they first looked at it, it was on all fours. She said that it ran across the branch and back a few times. Then it started covering its face with some leaves from a smaller branch. My grandma said that when it covered its face, they would pop under the water. Then when it would uncover its face, they would pop back out of the water. Like a game of peekaboo. The monkey seemed to enjoy this, as it made an O shape with its mouth. She said it panted like a dog. I guess this whole time, it had been in a squat position. Then all of a sudden, it got up on the branch, and ran on two legs back to the trunk of the tree. She said that freaked her and her friend out a little. When it got on two legs, it was bigger than they expected. Until then it was kind of balled up. But when it stood, they saw it was over five feet tall. She said it had big feet, and she said it ran like a two-year-old. When it got to the trunk of the tree, it gripped it like the way a squirrel does, and shimmied so it was out of sight. She and her friend sat in silence for a minute, wondering what exactly they should do and just what exactly they were seeing when they heard people coming down the path. It was five boys, two of which were her cousins. She said that though there were only five of them, they had enough guns for a dozen. They stopped and told the girls they've been chasing a monkey and asked if they saw anything. My grandma said, of course not, and you didn't see a monkey. My grandma told me passionately, I didn't need those troublemakers shooting my peekaboo monkey. And the boys moved on, but not before taking my grandma's shoes. She said that a minute after the troublemakers left, the monkey partially shimmied back around the trunk, bleated like a goat, then leapt from branch to branch, and was gone just like that. Yes, I asked my dad if Grandma was known for telling tall tales, or making up stories or pranks. My dad said no, not that he was aware of. I asked my dad if his mom ever told him that story. He said no, but he wouldn't doubt it happened. He lived in the same area until a few years before I was born. He said the woods were immense, and gave off weird vibes. But I guess the area has become something of a vacation destination. I think my grandma hadn't thought about this in a very long time. When you're in your 80s, who knows what a long time is. I found it very interesting how my grandma clearly was taken aback by seeing the Patterson Bigfoot on my monitor, as if it sparked her memory. It was kind of like she recognized it. Like she'd seen it before. I asked why she didn't just think it was a chimpanzee. Because she was very clear that it was monkey-like. She said it was like a big monkey. I was expecting to hear about its legs because that's the part that sounds Bigfooty, But she gave me a bless-your-heart look and said, I've never heard of anyone seeing a chimpanzee in Missouri, but I've heard people say that they've seen that. Anyway, like the video, subscribe if you haven't already. And as always, thanks an awful lot for listening.